Hi everyone, we're looking at chapter 10 this week, Introduction to Simple Experiments. And we've been talking a little bit about experiments and causal claims uh, as we've led up to this chapter, but now we'll look specifically at how do we set up a simple experiment, um, what are some of the variables, how do they support causal claims, different types of experimental designs. So we'll look at independent and within groups designs and a couple of variances of that. And then uh, ending with how do we interrogate the causal claims with those four validities that we've talked about throughout the semester. So uh, we're building on everything we've learned and then we will continue to build on this in our next uh, topic later. We'll talk later about uh, how we add more than one variable to get complex and factorial design experiments. But let's keep it simple for now and look at how do we set up a simple uh, experiment. So let's say that we wanted to know, uh, we wanted to know something up here, right? What are the advantages of longhand note taking over laptop note taking? So how does note taking affect somebody's um, exam score, their score on an essay question? So let's say that somebody was required or a group of people, we have them watch a TED talk, while taking notes either on their laptop or by hand. And then there's gonna be some kind of distraction just to create a little bit of space and time in between. And then they're going to take a test. Now this could totally be an experiment that we do, a simple experiment where people uh, watch a TED talk, they take notes through a couple of different methods, and then we give them a test uh, to see how they score on essay questions that have been standardized. Now the independent variable in this example here would be um, their note taking style, right? So how are they taking notes? Are they either taking notes by laptop or by longhand? Those are the different conditions or levels of the independent variable, something we talked a lot about a couple of weeks ago. And the dependent variable that we are measuring, the outcome variable that we are interested in, would be their score on the standardized essay questions. So this again could easily be an experiment that we do where people watch that TED talk, take notes through a couple of different conditions or levels of the independent variable, and then we give them all the same test at the end uh, to see how well they do. And if there were any statistically significant differences between how they did when they took notes by laptop versus longhand, a very kind of uh, straightforward experiment that we could easily do uh, and get some information from. Now, we'll use that experiment as an example, but if you go back, why do experiments support causal claims? We talked about uh, these three things before, that you have to have three things present in order to be able to make a claim that infers cause. And experiments, if set up correctly, do allow us to infer that one thing has caused another, that things are causally connected to each other unlike uh, correlations or associations where they just have a naturally occurring relationship. But in order to be able to infer cause, we have to establish covariance, temporal precedence, and internal validity. So we'll talk a little bit more about each one of these, but covariance, temporal precedence, and internal validity are three things that must be present in order for a causal claim to be supported. So when we talk about covariance, we've talked about covariance several times now when things are varying with each other or correlated with each other, connected, associated, they have to have some relationship. So there needs to be a relationship between these two things, right? So even if we're not establishing anything else yet, we do have to establish that these two factors are uh, related to each other or vary with each other. And one way that we might do that is to look at the independent variable as compared to what. And this is a really big thing that we need to have in experiments. We need to have comparison groups and control groups or treatment placebo groups. We have to have different groups present within our experiments in order to be able to make a comparison. A comparison group or comparison condition is just a different condition that we have that we can then compare to the control. The group that doesn't have the treatment, um, if there is a control group, right? So we have different groups within our experiments to try and establish that things do connect or vary or correlate or associate with each other. 
A different type of group that we might end up with in, um, depending on the type of experiment, we might also have a group that we call a treatment group versus a placebo group. So maybe we're interested in uh, the symptoms that somebody shows after they get a COVID vaccine. And so we have a group that gets the treatment, they get the actual vaccine, whether it's Moderna or Pfizer or Johnson & Johnson. And then maybe we have a group that just gets a placebo. They get uh, an inert treatment. Maybe it's just on some form of like sugar water or something that doesn't actually contain an active ingredient. And then what we do is we can compare these groups to each other. Is there a difference between the treatment group and the placebo group? Is there a difference between the comparison group and the control group? And so we can compare these things and does the independent variable vary with the dependent variable? And that allows us to establish a degree of covariance or relationship between the things that we are studying. Absolutely crucial in order to be able to make a causal claim. We also have to establish temporal precedence. So time, temporal referring to time, does the causal variable come before the effect, right? So we might manipulate uh, the situation to see if it comes first in time or not. Right? We need to establish that whatever it is that we are studying comes before the effect. Right? And so we might manipulate this in the experiment just to make sure that our causal variable does in fact come before the effect variable and that they have um, a temporal precedence relationship to each other. Well-designed experiments also establish internal validity. And we talked about internal validity uh, at many points so far. Uh, but are there alternative explanations for the results? How well have we designed the experiment to control for confounds? Are there any other variables that might vary systematically with the independent variable? Sometimes we call this uh, systemic or systematic variability. Have we controlled for other things? Are there other explanations for the results? Maybe it's not the type of notes that they take or how they take the notes, uh, but maybe it's, uh, you know, how good of a note taker somebody is that matters more. How well have we tried to control for other confounds or explanations? And have we set up the experiment in a way that we can systematically eliminate those other variables? If we've done that and we have a high degree of internal validity, then we can be pretty confident in the claims that we're making. If we haven't done that and we have low internal validity, then there might be other alternative um, explanations for the results and our interpretations and results might be largely meaningless. So again, um, other things that we can add to that list, are there other alternative explanations for the results? There can sometimes also be what are called selection effects. And this is going back a little bit to um, our participants and who we're picking and how we're putting them into groups. Sometimes participants in one level or condition of the independent variable might differ from the other levels. So one way that we can control for that is something called random assignment. And I talked about this a little bit um, as opposed to random selection, random assignment is when we randomly put people into the groups in our study. So maybe we randomly select um, who is going to be put into the laptop group versus the longhand group. And by doing this randomly and randomly assigning people, we counter for these selection effects and we make it where we kind of render those selection effects inert and they no longer matter because we have randomly assigned people to the different groups. So random assignment you will see is a very common cure for issues with internal validity. We make sure that we have people randomly assigned to the different treatment conditions or treatment groups or comparison groups and by doing that, it counters uh, some of the selection effects that we might see, helping us to establish better internal validity. A couple of different types of experimental designs. Uh, one basic designation that we can make is an independent groups design versus a within groups design. An independent groups design, sometimes called between subjects, looks at different groups of participants placed at different levels of the independent variable. And so this is a very common type of experiment. One group of people sees one set of test signs and a different group sees a different set. And then they're all tested on the same dependent measure. 
right? So we have two different groups of people who, and we're looking at the differences between the subjects. So the groups are independent of each other and we're comparing between the two groups. Within groups design is going to look at each participant is presented with all levels of the independent variable. We have one big group and we're looking at the differences within the subject, not between them. So here, the group is going to get both conditions. They get to expose to both sets of signs and then they get the same dependent measure. And so we're looking at what are the differences within our groups and within our subjects uh, as they've gotten exposed to every single condition or level of the independent variable rather than between our subjects and are the differences between the different groups. So a very kind of um, basic distinction, are we looking at the difference within a group or between the groups? Uh, a few things that we can add to that when we're looking at independent group designs, so independent between subject designs, we can have a couple of different uh, designs within that as well. It can break down even further. We can have one that we call a post-test only design, where we randomly assign uh, people to independent variable groups, and then we test them on the dependent variable once. So we're gonna randomly assign them to these different groups, I randomly assign them to the laptop group or the longhand group, and then they take the comprehension test, right? So one test, one measure, post-test only. So only after they have done the independent variable and been exposed to the condition, do we then test them. Not the best design. Post-test only design can give you great information, but it's typically better to do what we call a pre-test, post-test design. We get a little bit more information here, and sometimes that can help us uh, with a little bit of our internal validity uh, struggles or, or controls. With a pretest, post test design, we randomly assign people to their independent variable groups. So they're randomly assigned, and then we test them on the dependent variable before and after their exposure to the different levels of the independent variable. So let's say that we were interested, and this is an example in the textbook, we were interested um, in whether or not a mindfulness class or a nutrition class is going to affect somebody's verbal GRE score. So we randomly are going to assign people um, to the two different conditions. We test their GRE score ahead of time. So now we have a baseline test. They take the mindfulness class or the nutrition class, depending on which group they were put into. And then we test their score again, and we see if it's changed since they've been exposed to the independent variable conditions. So pre-test, post-test gives us a great um, kind of pre and post indicator, and get a, kind of a before and after measure, which can really help us uh, with some of that confound information and internal validity. When we look at within groups designs or repeated measures designs, uh, within, within groups, repeated measures means that they are going to be measured on the dependent variable after exposure to each level of the independent variable. We are going to repeatedly measure them, hence the name. We're measuring them repeatedly, so more than once. So one group, they taste chocolate, they rate the chocolate, then they taste it alone and rate the chocolate. We're measuring them multiple times and we're gonna see, are there any differences in their liking of chocolate with a confederate being present or tasting it alone? All right, so we're gonna look at measuring them um, after they've had it with a confederate and after they've tasted it alone. Different measures, but we're measuring the same people repeatedly. And again, we're interested in the within group differences because this is a within groups design. We can also have something called a concurrent measures design, where people are exposed to all levels of the independent variable at roughly the same time, and a single attitude or preference is measured as the dependent variable. So we have a group that gets um, a female face and a male face, and, and then we measure the preference, another example from the textbook. So with concurrent measures, they're exposed to everything at roughly the same time, rather than having different levels of exposure. And we'll talk about that more in later chapters. When you do things like this one, this last slide, 
where you might have what are called order effects. That may be something about tasting the chocolate with a confederate first or tasting chocolate alone first might affect somebody's ratings. Well, we won't worry about that yet. We'll get to that later. Um, there can be some order effects that come up and threats to internal validity that emerge depending on the type of design that we choose. Now there are some things, so here's the order effect. Um, I didn't want you to worry about it yet, but now we're there. Um, so depending on the way that we do these, we can have some problems, right? We can definitely uh, create situations where exposure to one level or condition of the independent variable might influence somebody's reactions later or practice effects where maybe people get better or worse due to practice or fatigue or carryover effects where something can maybe contaminate or carry over from one condition to the next. For example, maybe your first bite of chocolate is always better because it's richer and it's new. And so depending on which group you have, it might artificially appear as better or worse because of things like order, practice and carryover effects. So all of these things are sometimes considered internal validity threats, and we might have to counter for them in certain ways. And there are lots of ways that we can do that. The most effective way is something called counterbalancing. So when we're trying to counterbalance, we just rearrange the conditions. We randomly assign people to different conditions, and then we're going to try and use them in all possible orders. And by putting things in all possible orders, we eliminate the order effect and practice effects and so on. And we could do this completely. A full counterbalance means that all possible conditions and all possible orders have been used and arranged. Or we can do it partially if we feel that that statistically will be enough. And the, the book gives an example of something called a Latin square, where we can lay this out in kind of a complicated formula to decide who goes in what group and what order but the essence of counterbalancing is that we are trying to randomly assign people to groups and then get every possible order and condition so that we can eliminate those threats to internal validity. Again, the whole goal here is by setting up the experiment properly, controlling for all of these possible confounds and issues and effects that could happen that we can actually infer cause. If we don't control for these things, then maybe the order mattered more than anything else. And we wouldn't be able to adequately or confidently uh, infer any kind of cause from our results. So in the end of all this, right, when we're interrogating causal claims with the four, sorry, four validities, right, we are looking at each one of these, right, construct validity, external validity, statistical validity, and internal validity. All of these are playing a role and all of these need to be addressed and uh, you know, kind of um, accounted for whenever we're doing an experiment where we're trying to make a causal claim. With construct validity, how well do the measurements and the manipulations capture the conceptual variables in our theory? We're looking at issues of reliability and validity as we talked about quite a bit last week and the week before. With external validity, who can the causal claim generalize to? Do we do random sampling or probability sampling methods? And if our sample was good, that's gonna help us to generalize to the, to the general public or to people beyond our experiment. Statistical validity, is there a statistically significant difference between our groups? And we're not getting crazy into this in our class, but if things co-vary and there are differences, are we sure that they didn't occur by chance? can we statistically conclude that one type of note taking is better than the other? And by how much, right? There's a whole bunch of different statistical formulas for that, uh, which are beyond the scope of this class. And then finally, internal validity, which we spent a lot of time talking about in this chapter, are there alternative explanations for the outcome? Have we controlled for design confounds uh, by randomly assigning people to groups? Are there selection effects and order effects? Have we counterbalanced to potentially address for any selection or order effects that could be present? So with any type of causal claim that we're making, we wanna make sure that we have those three criteria and that we're also evaluating the claim from these four different validities that we uh, have been talking about for weeks, 
and will continue to uh, make appearances throughout the rest of the semester. So uh, again, we're, we're building and building and building a lot of information. I hope you're all hanging in there with it. Um, hopefully the discussion opportunity for this week will help you to apply some of this a little bit better um, and give you more practice with it. But make sure you get going on the other required materials for the week. Pay attention to those weekly deadlines uh, and I will see you all for our next lecture and topic next week.